Matthew 20, verse 17. Let's read together. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are. We are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. God, this is your holy word. It is truth. It does not waver and it does not change. And God, I pray that you give us ears to hear it today, a heart to believe it, and with your help, Holy Spirit, to actually walk it out and to obey. God, I pray that you would teach us what true greatness really looks like in your kingdom And what that looks like as your kingdom citizens, as your children, as followers of Jesus, may we have the same posture and same mindset as that of you, Jesus, the heart of a servant. So I pray that you would change and renew our minds today. That when we leave here, we would walk away not longing for the praise and the accolades of man, but that we would see ways that we can care and serve others around us, all pointing people to Jesus and to your glory, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So in your text there, we start out with Matthew 20 and verse 17, and this is the third time that Jesus is, is, is helping them see to direct, to direct their, his disciples' attention that, hey, as we're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. Some things are going to unfold. And each of these three times, Jesus gives them a little bit more information. And this time, he goes even more clearly saying that that the Son of Man is actually going to be crucified, where the other two times, it just said he would be killed and would rise. This time, he says the Son of Man will be crucified and will rise. Now, what's interesting is as this is unfolding, as Jesus is trying to help them get an understanding of what's ahead and what's coming their way, I I still don't think they fully understand completely about Christ's kingdom and what he came to establish at this season. And so what's interesting is in Matthew 20, after Jesus shares this, that in essence, guys, in a little while, as we head to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be arrested, condemned, and crucified, but will rise again. And yet, in in light of this conversation, look what happens in Matthew 20. Have you ever had somebody that says something to you that doesn't fit? You ever had that? Here's one of those moments. So Jesus reveals this again for the third time to his disciples, and look at verse 20. It says, And the mother of the sons of Zebedee, this is James and John, and their mom, they come up to Jesus and they kneel before him and they ask for something. Look at verse 21, what they say. He says to her, what do you want? She says to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit on your right and on your left in your kingdom. Like, I still think that the disciples are still thinking that, that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom, his rule, his reign on earth in this next season. And so they're like, hey, listen, well, 
I like my boys, and I think you like them, and so why don't you put this guy on your right and this guy on your left? Kind of doesn't really feel like it fits the moment from what Jesus just revealed about him being crucified, brutally murdered, killed. But here's this conversation. Jesus, would you remember my sons? But now before we just attack the mom, in the other gospel accounts, they don't give the mom as being part of the story. That the two boys are coming with their own desire to have this, this position, this title, this power. See, the request for position exposes the nature of selfish ambition, right? The request for position exposes the nature of selfish ambition. Their desire for greatness is a desire to sit on the right and on the left, the the most important seats. Jesus, you're the most important, but can we sit next to you? Can we have that position, that spot, that title? Isn't that kind of, though, the reality of us as humans? Like, we, we, why is it that our humanity longs for accolades? Why do we love the praise of men? Why do we like positions of power and entitlements? And yet it starts young. Remember being a little kid? And you had to get in the bathroom line? And what do the kids do? You fight for who's first. Or the last one. You don't, work, you don't fight for the middle position, right? How many have siblings in this room? How many fought for the shotgun seat position in the passenger of the car, the passenger seat of the car, right? I remember we'd get off the school bus, and at the school bus, our, our, our school bus was down the street at friends of ours' house. And if mom was there with a the minivan, we would sprint with our book bags, try to get to the passenger door to get in there first so we can have that seat. Why is it that we fight for position, for power? How many times as a kid did you fight for over the last piece of pizza at the dining room table? Why is it that you see in our culture, both young and old, that we will fight and tear down to anybody that we think is a threat? Oh, he's a threat to the girl that I'm interested in. He's a threat to my position on the team or the position I want in my job or they make me feel insecure or jealousy or envy gets raised up inside of us. And so what do we do? We tear down. How dare they look anywhere close to us so we will push, we will say, we will create gossip and false rumor. We, we as humans will compete for first place to win at all costs. We will fight and compete for first place in our business, in careers, in status, in sports. I'm not saying sports are wrong, but how many times we will take, doesn't matter, we'll go at all costs, kind of like the karate kid. Remember the last scene, sweep the leg? We'll do whatever it takes to win the fight to have first place. How many times we fight and have conflicts in marriages, and why? It's because our selfish desires are not being met. We have these expectations that we expect the others to meet our need, to serve us, and so all we see is through that lens. How many times people leave a church because they didn't get what they wanted. Because they saw church as me focus. You ever grown up in a church where they have their, their, um, their own pew? It's not written anywhere, but they'll make it known that if you sit in their pew, they're going to make a scene. We like our space, our position, our titles. How often we cheat, we exaggerate, and we manipulate to get the good grade, to make more money, or to get to the position. Again, we'll pull anybody out of the way to get to that spot. Why do we fight? 
Why do we quarrel? Why do we seek these things? James chapter 4 and verse 1 says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Or for some of us, so you gossip, so you cheat, so you tear down, so you manipulate. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And then James goes on, he says, you adulterous people, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That the world, society and culture has a viewpoint on how they view greatness and success and leadership. And this is what we're going to get at because this is in essence what, what... James and John are proposing with their mom, we want to sit in this seat, your right, your left, position of power, title. But look at how Jesus answers in verse 22. Jesus answered their mom and the two boys. He says, and you do not know, you do not know what you are asking Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? This cup of suffering, this cup of persecution. Are you able to drink that cup? And look what they say. They say to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, that's not for me to grant. It's for those for whom it has been given, prepared by my Father. So Jesus' response to their question to them is saying, hey, are you able to drink the cup that I am going to drink? This cup representing suffering, persecution. Do you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Three times he goes to pray, and he tells his disciples to be watchful and to pray, and each time Jesus, after he's done praying, what what are the the disciples doing? They're out cold. They're asleep. But Jesus, in essence, prays there in the garden of sinning, knowing that the cross is right there. Crucifixion is soon to happen. And Jesus, in essence, is like, hey, can you, would you take this cup from me? This cup, this cup that's going to be the evidence of your wrath and your justice and pain and suffering This crucifixion that will be him being nailed and killed on a cross? Is there any other way? Could you take this cup from me? And then what does Jesus respond? Not my will, but yours. See, what we need to understand is that the cost of discipleship, that greatness in God's kingdom is costly, Greatness in God's kingdom is costly. It causes you to lose your life. The cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus is to share his mission. To share his mission is to share its costs. What was Jesus' mission on earth? Obedient to the Father in what? Coming so that what? He would give his life. For sinners and sufferers to bring salvation, redemption. In the Expositor's Bible commentary, here's what they say in light of this cup that Jesus asked them. He says, It is often ignorance that seeks leadership, power, and glory. Let me say that again. He says, It is often ignorance that seeks leadership, power, and glory. The brothers do not know what they are asking. To ask to reign with Jesus is to ask to suffer with him. 
And not only do they not know what they are asking for, they have set, they have as yet no clear perceptions of Jesus' sufferings. To ask for worldly wealth and much honor is often to ask for anxiety, temptation, disappointment, and envy. And in the spiritual arena, arena, to ask for great usefulness and reward is often to ask for great suffering. I read this quote, and I wasn't sure who it was from, but this quote says, We know not what we ask when we ask for the glory of wearing the crown and ask not for grace to bear the cross in our way to it. Let me read it again. We know not what we ask when we ask for the glory of wearing the crown and ask not for grace to bear the cross in our way to it. There's a book that I read that was, it's been years ago, and I was looking at it again a little bit more this week, and it's called How the Mighty Have Fallen. And it's, it's a story connected, it's, it's a book connected to the life of King Saul. In a lot of ways where he fell short. But one of the things I, I thought was interesting is in his book, he makes a statement, he says, he says, authority is always to be granted, never to be demanded. Let me say that again. He says, authority is always to be granted, never to be demanded. Look in the Old Testament. When they anointed somebody as a prophet or a priest or a king, when you look at the New Testament, when you look at when they would select uh, elders, how many times was it authority that's passed down? And the, one of the points that he gets in this book is that when we demand authority, that means we're often demanding a position or a title. And sometimes when we demand that position, thinking, I've been working here for years, I deserve this, I deserve this role, that probably is a big sign that your character is not ready for that position yet. Because if you have to, to demand it, then maybe you're not ready for it. And often charisma can get us up the ladder pretty quickly of status, power, and position, but it doesn't mean that our character has caught up with it. And when we demand that position of authority and your character is not ready for it, that's how easily men like King Saul and many men that I've seen in ministry that have fallen, whether in a sexual sin or whether because of pride or whatever, that we want to get to a certain position quickly, but we don't want to go through the difficult seasons that God is doing that's through the challenges, the valleys, and the fire that he's growing your character, growing your faith, so that when God places you in this position here, it's this journey all throughout here that you hated, that you wanted to run away from, but God's like, hey, listen, I need you to stay here. I need you to lean on me. Why? Why? Because I'm doing something in you during this season that you may not understand, but it's growing you. It's perfecting you. It's getting ready for how I want to use you down here. Are you in that season where you're not understanding why you're in this valley or this challenges and you so badly want to be here and maybe you haven't gotten the position that you've applied for, you keep asking for it and you're like, why do I keep getting overlooked? Why does this person and this person who's worked less years at this job than I have, why do they keep getting the raise or that next step up? Why do I keep getting overlooked? And maybe, can I just remind you that maybe you're looking the wrong direction and maybe you need to say, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? Or where are you preparing me that might be somewhere different than what you expected? Because maybe you have a game plan in your own mindset that you've never submitted to God. You just said, hey, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to aim for this and aim for this. But where does God fit in the picture? Is he Lord of that story? Because when we're willing to surrender 
and be present in the season of life God has you, it might be a season that God is growing your character to prepare you for the position that he has for you down the road. But maybe there's a reason that you haven't gotten the position right now because if you demanded it right now, you might get it, but it doesn't mean that you're ready for it. This cup Jesus, in essence, saying, I can't grant you this, this title, but can you drink this cup? Are you willing to go through the things that I will go through ahead of you and lead the way in? And church history tells us that James and John do bear that cup, this cup of suffering and persecution. In Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, We see James. He's the first of the apostles that is killed and martyred for Jesus. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. We know about the other brother is John. What do we know about John? Was John killed? Man, he was mistreated, and then he was placed on the island of Patmos. If you read the beginning of Revelation, this is where John describes that. And he's placed on this island of Patmos. It's where there he gets this revelation from God about what's going to happen in the end. Both endured. Both drank the cup that Jesus mentions. But then look at verse 24. It says, And when the ten heard it, So after the 10, the the rest of the disciples hear what James and John and their mom ask and make this request of Jesus. It says they're indignant at the two brothers. They're angry. They're upset. In verse 25, it says, But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Jesus is always looking for these teachable moments. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he spends more time with the few, with the 12, than with the masses. And here, after this conversation, he goes a little further and says, hey, let me remind you guys. You, you, you see how the Roman leaders lead? You see how these Gentiles rule and lead over? With all their power and greed and self-promotion, To teach a moment here. We see in our world, right, a person starts with a job, works their way to the top where they become the boss, the CEO, and everyone underneath them does what? Serves them. But Jesus is going to explain more about his kingdom. He says, let me flip that idea that societal norm, and flip it right side up, the way it was meant to be, the way kingdom citizens are to live. These Gentiles, they ruled over. They're consumed with pride and arrogance and greed and corruption. And God has no desire for the proud. Right? What does James say? That God gives grace, gives more grace. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 16, 18 said, Pride goes before what? Destruction. And a haughty spirit before fall. The world has that viewpoint in how they view their leadership because they think, look, I got myself here. Look at me. It's how the Pharisees were during Jesus' day. They had a look at me mentality, this pride, this arrogance because of their religious status, their rules. Matthew 23, verse 4 says that these Pharisees, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers. And look at verse 5 they do all their deeds for what reason? To be seen by others. 
For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor and feast and the best seats in the synagogues. I wonder in the church, do we fall prey into that same mentality? Do we serve just so that we're noticed? Do we serve with this mindset of, uh, I scratch your back, so then you need to scratch my back? Do we serve for the praise of man? Or do we see our positions as power and how people can serve me? And sad to say, the world has leaked into the, the culture of the church. Because we view success, we view people through those lenses. We see the position of someone on stage as if they have, that everyone should serve them, and that is not the case. The pastor is meant to be the shepherd that is willing to lay down his life for his sheep with what my Savior has done. That we are to serve one another, the bride, not so it's to build me up, but so I build the body up. Why do you serve? Do you serve to just feel good about yourself? Do you serve to check your box off? What motivates your service? What motivates your caring, your giving? What's the motivation? Is it look at me? So look at verse 26. Jesus continues on. He says, this is how the world around you does it. Then he says this, it shall not be so among you. My children, my followers, my disciples. That mindset, that way of living, that societal norm is not to be the culture of my kingdom. He says, but whoever would be great among you must be what? A servant. And whoever would be first among you, he hits the point even harder, must be a slave. Even as a son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Look what he says. Jesus says, it shall not be so among you. This should not be one of your, this should not be the characteristics of you. This is not what it looks like in the kingdom of God. He's contrasting worldly greatness versus kingdom-minded greatness. And the two are drastically different. See, Jesus says, to be truly great is to be a servant. And to be first is to put yourself in a position of being a slave. See, in the pagan world of Jesus' day, humility wasn't regarded as a virtue. They saw humility as a vice. Looked down upon. Looks weak. That's true about our culture today. See, to be in first place in God's eyes is to put others' needs first, to be a servant of others. Jim Peterson, in his book called The Insider, he says that serving is meeting another person's need because we are motivated by a desire to express love and gratitude to Christ for his unspeakable service to us. He says, serving is meeting another person's need because we are motivated, why? By a desire to express love and gratitude to Christ for his unspeakable service to us. See, servant leadership. Servant leadership is what we're to be about That leadership isn't wrong. It's how you use your position of leadership. And in a kingdom-minded viewpoint, a leader is to be a servant 
leader. It's using your position of influence for the betterment of others, seeking to put their needs above their own. But here's the challenge. It's costly. It demands sacrifice. And it goes completely against our flesh. To really, truly serve, to really, truly put the needs of somebody else before our own, to be a servant-minded leader, it causes you to deny self. It causes you to set your needs aside to put their needs above your own. And that's not always easy. How's that working out for us in marriage, guys? Do we have some growing to do in that area? I know I do. Let me give you a couple of qualifications or, or some characteristics of servant leadership, what it is. Servant leadership is motivated by love, characterized by humility, eyes that look for opportunity, hands that seek to help, and life that models after Christ. Servant leadership, the first one I says motivated by love. What's motivating your, your service? Is it love for God and love for people? Do you know why you serve? And I'm not talking about just in here in church. Why do you stay after work to help your coworker? Or your manager, help them get the project done because you want to see them succeed as well. What motivates that? Because I really believe that the aroma of Christ can be displayed around the world when we show the, the posture of a servant leader, when we reflect the heart of our Savior Jesus to the world around us, that we look completely different to the culture when we live that out. When the student stays after class a little while to help the teacher or clean a classroom up, to the rest of the class, you might think that they look like you're a brown noser, a stuck up, trying to get one up where they get a better grade from the teacher. But really deep down, is it a, hey, I want to serve because I want to see my teacher come to know Christ. And I want them to see my character and my attitude and my servant heart. I want them to see in my life that there's something different, that it's Christ. Servant leadership is characterized by humility. How's that working out on the, on the soccer field? How's that working out in the court? How's that working out with your teammates? Is it I'm the captain, so therefore I, it goes and you're going to demand everybody else? Or are you saying, hey, I'm using my position as a captain to how do I care for and serve even the freshmen? Because I want them to see my character. I want them to see the heart of Jesus that's in me and the way that I'm going to look different than the rest of the teammates. Not because I'm better than, but I want to humbly figure out ways that I can serve and help these guys grow in the sport. It's characterized by humility. It's eyes that look for opportunity. Guys, can I challenge us? True, a true heart of a servant does not wait to be asked but looks for opportunity and how they can engage and serve somebody. And if they don't know what to do, then they ask a question, how can I help you? Man, do I long for our church to be that mindset. If you are a person that your mindset is like, well, they don't ask me, so I'm not going to do it, then you know what? Then maybe there's a deeper heart issue that God needs to work in you for all of us to have actual eyes to see needs physically, and people that we can care for. But yet, how often I hear people leave churches and leave our church because the statement I hear is, well, nobody visited me, nobody talked to me, nobody did this, nobody did that, and they came with an expectation of what? Me. Now, again, we all have seasons of need. I get that. There are times when some of us are hurting and going through some deep grief and struggles and brokenness. And that's where the church needs to come around to with that eyes to see and say, hey, they're hurting. How do I come alongside and carry this burden with them? So that's a need. But are you also one that just sees the church as 
The church needs to always meet your need. How long have you been coming? Have you gotten engaged to care for somebody else or get involved or work and serve and use the gifts that God's given you? Because there's more joy when you use the gifts and talents that God's given you for his kingdom and for his glory than it will be for anything else you put your hands to in this world. Hands that seek to help. A life that models after Christ. See, that's what Jesus, that's what closes here. He says that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. That Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, modeled the posture, modeled the life of what he wants his citizens to live like. It's to be a servant motivated by love. Let me read it. We need to close up, but let me read a text from you from Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 3. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. How's that working out for us? (laughs) Nothing. That's hard. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But look at this. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Count others more significant than yourselves. We're just going to hang there for a second. I'm going to say that again. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then look what it says. This is what I love. One of my favorite verses. He says, have this mind among yourselves. Or some translations say, have this attitude, the same attitude as whom? As Christ. He says, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who though, okay, now Paul's getting out how Christ was our example. He says, who though he was in the form of God, Jesus was in the form of God, But he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. But even though Jesus is God, he was willing to set aside his glory by emptying himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus is our example. What was his mindset? He humbled himself. He took the form of a servant, becoming a man, living his life for the point of what? Giving it up on a cross on our behalf. See, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. Ransom means a purchase price. The price paid for a slave or a prisoner. And Jesus paid that price for you and I. He humbled himself. He became a servant. The God of the universe took on human flesh and humbled himself to not come to say, bow down to me, glorify me, but rather gave his life for a sinful, broken world. Why? Because there was a price that needed to be paid for our sin. The wages of sin is what, church? Is death. The gift of God is eternal life. The gift that God has provided for us to have eternal life is Christ. And Jesus paid the debt for our sins on that cross. He died, was crucified. And it was that death, that perfect sacrifice and his blood that was shed was payment enough to appease God. His justice and his wrath was appeased through Christ's death on the cross so that we could be set free and forgiven and made right with God if we would repent and believe 
in Jesus. Worldly greatness is look at me. Look at what I've done. It seeks to take the glory. But let me remind us, church, we were never meant to touch or take the glory. The glory is his. Kingdom greatness is to look at Jesus and look at others. It seeks outward focus rather than inward focus. It seeks to love God and love others. Let's pray. Lord, we, are, we humbly rem- are reminded this morning that this, this mindset, this posture of being a servant is impossible in our own strength. And first and foremost, God, I pray that you would captivate our heart and consume our mind with remembrance, to be reminded of the extent that you went on our behalf, Jesus. How extravagant your love was for the Father and how incredible your love is for us as sinners. That you would willingly, willingly, you weren't forced, but you willingly obeyed the Father's plan and you willingly gave your life up for us. So I pray, God, that we would remember well the extent that you went on our behalf and what you did for us and that you would propel us being motivated by love for you and love for others would walk in humility seeking to care, to listen, to come alongside and to meet the needs of others around us above our own. And teach us how to die to self. Daily we need your help with that, Lord. To die to self. Give us your eyes to see. To see those around us. And Jesus, we praise you and we thank you. That you're you're our example. But you've also given us your spirit. To empower us to help us walk this out. So, Lord, we ask for your help, and we praise you that salvation was given to us because you took the form of a servant. May we lead like you, Jesus, as a servant. In Jesus' name, amen.